that's entitled Research Priorities, the Impact of Gender on the Scope, Funding, and Analysis of Research. I think you're gonna find this one really stimulating. And I'm gonna introduce our moderator, Dan Carpenter, who is the Director of Social Sciences Program here at Radcliffe. Um, and the Ali S. Freed Professor of Government at the Faculty of Arts and Sciences here, and Director of the Center for American Political Studies at Harvard. If the panel would come on up, the time is right. Good afternoon, and thanks everybody for coming. We have a really exciting panel on a fascinating subject today. Health research is funded, conducted, and analyzed by many actors in our global society, ranging from universities like Harvard and its uh, associated hospitals, uh, to companies and corporations, government agencies, hospitals, both public and private, including parochial, various networks of offices, and increasingly even in the area of health policy research, think tanks and foundations. Um, that complex of actors, both engenders and genders uh, health research in ways that I think is uh, profound and that our uh, distinguished panel is going to shed light upon. I'm gonna introduce them in alphabetical order, uh, but let me note that uh, Peggy Orenstein will go first followed by uh, Noelle Barry Mertz and then uh, Baron Lerner. Noelle Barry Mertz is the Women's Guild Chair in Women's Health and the Director of the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center and of the Preventative and Rehabilitative Cardiac Center in the Cedars-Sinai Heart Institute, where she is also a professor of medicine. Baron Lerner is a professor of medicine and population health at the NYU School of Medicine and the author of the acclaimed Breast Cancer Wars, The Breast Cancer Wars, Hope, Fear, and the Pursuit of a Cure in 20th Century America. And Peggy Ornstein is the author, author of four books, including the New York Times bestsellers Cinderella Ate My Daughter and Waiting for Daisy. She writes frequently about the politics of breast cancer, including our feel-good war on breast cancer, a cover story in the New York Times in April 2013. This is, however, her first public lecture on breast cancer. So with that, let me introduce Peggy Orenstein. Uh, please give her our warm welcome as to all of our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, so um, I'm here today, am I on now? Yeah, there I go. Uh, to, to guide you um, through the thicket of the mammography wars as both a um, reporter and as a consumer. So I was first diagnosed with breast cancer myself in 1997, and my disease came back about 17 years later in the same breast in 2012. Um, that's not typical, but it does happen. And that experience put me in a unique position uh, to watch the arc of this debate, and I kind of like to say that I quite literally have skin in this game. So I've watched as breast cancer has become the biggest disease on the cultural map. It's bigger than even more prolific killers of women, such as heart disease, which I'm sure Noelle will talk about. And I've watched as the breast cancer awareness movement ballooned between my two diagnoses until just about every place that I went, the supermarket, the dry cleaner, the gym, the gas pump, the mall, the florist, wherever you go, you would see posters proclaiming that early detection is the best protection and that mammograms save lives. Screening has been the fundamental plank of the pink ribbon platform. And so I want to talk today a little bit about how that happened and how, and some of the unintended consequences of all that well-meaning um, awareness. So early detection is based on the theory that goes back to the 19th century that all cancer starts with a single cell that goes rogue and it progresses in a um, predictable way and at some invar invariable point, it leaps to the rest of the body where it becomes deadly. One thing that I've found in talking to women is they don't realize that um, cancer in your breast doesn't kill you, that it has to go into the other organs or the bones before it becomes deadly. So the idea was that you could cure it if you could cut it out before it made this lethal leap. The thing is that there was no real evidence that the size of a tumor necessarily predicted whether or not it had spread. But physicians of the day embraced that theory anyway um, because they wanted something that they could do 
for this disease that people were increasingly dying from. So in 1913, a group of them banded together and formed an organization which ev eventually became the American Cancer Society to spread the word about early detection through pamphlets, magazine articles, and an army of women that went door to door to tell their neighbors that cancer was deadly, but that they could survive it if they got to their doctors in time. And the campaign worked, sort of. Um, more people did go to their doctors, more cancers were detected, more operations were performed, but the rates of women who were dying of breast cancer barely budged. All those increased diagnoses were not translating into saved lives, and that should have been the first clue that something about the early detection theory was amiss. But instead, physicians thought that they just needed to find the disease even earlier. So enter mammography. The first trials began in 1963, and they found that screening healthy women along with the clinical breast exam reduced breast cancer death rates by 25%. That decrease, decrease from the get-go was almost entirely among women in their 50s, but they thought it was only logical that if they started screening women younger um, and finding cancer even earlier, the results would be even more spectacular and maybe they could even um, cure cancer. The trick was that women had to comply and they weren't doing it. By the early 1980s, only 20% of women were, um, who were eligible were getting mammograms, and Nancy Brinker founded the Komen Foundation to boost those numbers because she was convinced that early detection could have saved her sister, Susan, who died of the disease at age 36. Three years later, National Breast Cancer Awareness Month was launched, also to promote screening. And the corporate underwritten message was um, of, personal, of personal empowerment fit neatly with the larger cultural narrative for women at the time of increasing political, social, professional, academic empowerment, as well as the message of the women's health movement that we needed to take control of our own health. So there were soon millions of pink-garbed racers running across America for the cure, as well as legions of pink consumer products, pink buckets of KFC, pink yogurt lids, pink vacuum cleaners, pink dog leashes. But the message was essentially the same as in 1913, and that's that breast cancer was deadly, but the good news was that through vigilance and early detection, surviving it was within a woman's control. By 2000, that pink ribbon was inescapable, and close to three quarters of women over 40 in America were undergoing screening. The annual mam mammogram was a near sacred rite, and it was so precious that in 2009, when an independent federally funded task force found that women should actually begin screening at 50 and do it every other year, the result was not relief, but fury. Women had been bombarded for so many years by early detection campaigns, like the one that chided, if you haven't had a mammogram, you need more than your breasts examined, that it was no wonder that surveys showed that they now thought screening didn't just detect breast cancer, but actually prevented it. At that time, the debate in Congress over healthcare reform was at its peak. So rather than engaging in discussion about how to maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of screenings, Republicans seized on the panel's recommendations as an attempt at health care rationing. The Obama administration was accused of, of um, indifference to the li lives of Americans' mothers, sisters, daughters, and wives. And in response, the administration buckled and they immediately issued a statement saying that their policies on screenings remained un unchanged. And when I talked to some of the scientists who had been on that panel, they were frankly gobsmacked. You know, they just thought, we had science on our side. And what they didn't realize was that disease and risk, as we've been talking about, is as much of a social construct as it is a medical construct, and that sometimes public perceptions and beliefs will trump actual facts. In the years since then, the studies questioning the benefits of mammography have kept on coming. This February, one of the largest and most meticulous ever to be done uh, made front page news by questioning the mortality benefit of screening healthy women at any age. So what happened to those early gains? Well, for one thing, treatment is better now than it was uh, when those first trials were, were done. So the use of drugs like tamoxifen, this is my one visual aid, my tamoxifen. <laughs> have offset mammography's initial benefits. We also now know that breast cancer is not one disease. It's a group of diseases, and that mammograms turn out to be not so great at detecting the lethal forms at a treatable phase. 
Those tumors progress too quickly. They often crop up between mammograms. And even if they are found when they're too small to be felt, uh, it's often too late, they've already metastasized. Meanwhile, and so that means that the ones, the, the women who, are, who have the most deadly form of the disease, um, the ones who really need our attention, um, for them, mammography is not so useful. And meanwhile, at the other end of the spectrum, mammography is great at finding tumors that would be equally treatable if they were found later by a woman or her doctor. It's also really good at finding tumors that are so slow moving that they'd never be life threatening. So when I was doing my reporting, the conservative estimate was that 15% of the women diagnosed with cancer through a mammogram benefited from the test. And that's not nothing. But to put it another way, for an individual woman in her 50s, annual screening may find breast cancer, but it will only reduce her risk of dying of the disease over the next 10 years by 0.07 percentage points from 0.53 to 0.46%. Meanwhile, about those harms, most recently, just about a little over a week ago, um, the Harvard Medical School uh, found that 19% of women who are diagnosed with breast cancer as a result of a mammogram are overdiagnosed. That's about one in five women as a result of the, of the mammogram, and they're getting surgery, chemo or, or chemo or radiation to treat cancer that was never life-threatening. And those treatments, of course, themselves can be life-threatening. So that means, when I do the math, that 15% of women diagnosed with cancer through a mammogram will benefit by early detection, 19% will be overtreated, and for the other 66%, the test will make no difference. They would have lived or died whether or not their tumor was found when it was too small to feel. One of the biggest issues in the places where we have a pressing need for research around this is a condition called ductal carcinoma in situ, when abnormal cells are found in the lining of the milk ducts of the breast. DCIS is found almost exclusively through screening, and it accounts for 25% of new breast ca cancer cases annually. By 2020, a million American women will be living with DCIS diagnoses. And on the surface, it seems a triumph of early detection. It's easily treatable. It has a 100% 10-year survival rate. But the thing is, in most cases, it will stay right where it is. In situ means in place. So it lacks the capacity to spread, and by definition, can never become um, lethal. And so the trouble is we don't know which ones will and which ones won't. And what that means that it's sort of the equivalent of everybody coming in who has high cholesterol being given a heart bypass surgery in response to it. And the huge jump in DCIS potentially uh, transforms 50,000 healthy women a year into cancer survivors. And it contributes to this larger sense that breast cancer is everywhere and happening to everyone. And that, in turn, stokes women's anxiety about the disease and their personal vulnerability, increasing the demand for screening, which inevitably creates more cases of DCIS, and on and on. And the DCIS patients themselves are subject to all the pain, mutilation, side effects, and trauma that any cancer, is, uh, any cancer patient is subjected to and may never think of themselves as fully healthy again. Plus, now their mothers, daughters, sisters have a family history of cancer, so it, it spreads out um, generationally. Some, researchers are, some re researchers are pushing to rename DCIS by removing the big C, um, and that's really important because it turns out that when that's taken out, that women uh, are more conservative about their treatment. And right now, what we've been seeing is that there's been a 188% jump in women who choose to have both breasts removed when they have a diagnosis of DCIS in one breast, which is a risk, not actual cancer. So why do they overestimate their risk? Why do they respond like this? Why do we opt for the most extreme tre treatment? One historian told me, when you've oversold both the fear of cancer and the effectiveness, effectiveness of our prevention and treatment, even people harmed by a system will uphold it, saying it's all we have. And that brings me back to the pink ribbon. Organizations like Komen, which is virtually synonymous with breast cancer advocacy, have made it one of the most recognized logos of our time. The Pink Ribbon has raised the profile of the disease, encouraged women to speak about their experience, and transformed victims into survivors. It's also allowed corporations to look good to women, even if their products are linked to disease or other threats to public health. Meanwhile, despite the fact that Komen trademarked the phrase, for the cure, only 17% of what it raised in 2012 actually went to research, while 56% was spent on education and screening. So what I want to know is well, whether this latest uh, series of studies is going to push pink ribbon advocates to rethink that allocation 
and it'll be really interesting to see what happens next October um, during um, Pink Ribbon Months. But it's become all too clear and becoming clearer every day that we're not going to screen our way out of breast cancer. We're going to need to rethink, to reframe, to have some impact on what's actually important. Prevention, improving treatment, reducing toxicity, addressing social disparities, distinguishing among cases of DCIS, and better understanding of metastasis. Early on in the 2009 blow up, Nancy Brinker said that the new mammography guidelines were going to confuse women, which struck me as a kind of almost Orwellian thing where, where a woman becomes paternalistic towards other women by saying, there, there, don't worry about it, we don't want to confuse you. Personally, I think women can handle the truth. I think we can live with complexity. I think we can ha accept reality. And I think that awareness has to mean more than just visibility. And if we truly want to reduce the incidence and mortality from breast cancer, I think we can decide, and we have to decide, to do better, a lot better, for our own health and for those whose health is truly at risk. Thank you. Noelle. So I just need to project, yes. So uh, this is such an amazing uh, summit and I'm really looking forward to uh, everyone's presentation but also the discussion. Um, I was asked to talk about uh, women's heart health. I'm a cardiologist and I do clinical and translational investigation, much of it sponsored by our National Institutes of Health. So just as an opening statement, Heart disease kills 10 times more women in the US every year than breast cancer. We spend 10 times more money on breast cancer research than heart disease research in women, just as an opening statement. Second opening statement, 50% of us as women will develop heart disease in our lifetime. Look to the right, look to the left, one out of two women one out of three women will die of heart disease, and one quarter of them will be young women under the age of 50, under the age of 50. So just again, as we sort of talk about public health issues, uh, heart disease is really the, the epidemic now, the silent epidemic that needs to not be so silent uh, as we talk about public health. So here's some data to support what I just said. Um, these are plots and um, color-coded, so the female deaths, these are deaths due to heart disease, plotted in the red bars and males in the, in the blue bars. In 1984, women became the new majority of victims of heart disease. Um, this crept up on us pretty quickly. What I was taught in medical school, uh, graduating in 81, was that heart disease was a man's disease. So this rapidly shifted in a generation. Um, in 1991, Dr. Bernadine Healy, our then director of the National Institutes of Health, called attention to the Yentl syndrome, uh, which she believed that this epidemic of heart disease in women was due to the fact that women were not being recognized. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Uh, and it was a full uh, 12 years for our National Institutes of Health and our Center for Disease Control to recognize this epidemic. And I dare say, had it been an infectious disease epidemic, it would have been recognized much more quickly if it had anything to do with food or staphylococcus. I'm quite sure if it had anything to do with the prostate, it would have been recognized very quickly. So the Yentl syndrome that Dr. Bernadine Healy, a female cardiologist and the first uh, female director of our National Institutes of Health, uh, and worked closely with Lois as I, we were talking about at lunch. Um, she opined in the New England Journal of Medicine that she thought this epidemic had to do with the fact that because women, uh, when they presented with their heart disease, did not look like the male pattern heart disease that our 50 years of good research and development of new uh, early detection treatment uh, and life-saving therapy 
because women didn't have that male pattern of disease, uh, she thought that was uh, the reason for this epidemic. Uh, and of course, she was uh, borrowing from the Elizabeth, uh, excuse me, the Barbara Streisand movie uh, of the, the same name, the Yentl. And uh, that's a picture of Barbara on the right, looking like a man. And of course, the idea was in order to receive uh, the rights and the privileges, or in this case, the research and the uh, study and the effective treatment, you had to either be a man or look like a man. So this launched a large national heart, lung, and blood study that I chair called the Women's Ischemia Syndrome Evaluation. We are in our 18th year of continuous funding. Um, and we've described a number of important differences, some of which are biological, so we would call them sex differences, some of which are gender, which are sociocultural. Um, uh, as a biologist, I, I tend to focus on the biology, and I'll show you a few here. Um, we clearly were able to show that women having heart attacks and dying of heart, their heart attacks, and this is the leading cause of sudden death in our society, are characterized by plaque erosion, which uh, the top slide is a coronary artery of a female who died of sudden cardiac death. Her heart attack, she eroded that fatty cholesterol plaque, where the men are more likely to explode these plaques. It actually fractures, and the artery fills up with blood clot. And the important difference is that all of our diagnostics in the emergency room are looking for that explosion. And so we miss the erosions, and we miss the opportunity to deliver the life-saving therapy. Women are more likely sent home from the emergency room telling them that it might be their gallbladder or they might just have an anxiety disorder. We've also been able to demonstrate that women and men in their coronary arteries develop the cholesterol fatty plaque differently, and we uh, generated this hypothesis because of the way that women and men when we become obese, where we deposit fat. And you, you, you know this, when men get fat, where does the fat develop? The beer belly, right? And, and very fat men often look pregnant, where women will deposit that lovely cellulite that is right underneath the skin and pretty much everywhere, arms, buttocks, thighs. So we generated this hypothesis, and in fact, this, this research demonstrates that women, panel A on the top, uh, excuse me, man, panel A on the top, uh, generate lumpy, bumpy disease, which we will see easily with an angiogram, which is our main diagnostic uh, uh, therapy in, in cardiology, where women, uh, panel B on the bottom, much more diffuse. Their arteries are also smaller, so it's harder for us to see the fatty plaque buildup. And again, uh, the R&D of 50 years uh, generated to a male pattern is just not adequately serving uh, many of our women. So we have now translated this into large-scale uh, population studies. Uh, this is an editorial that I wrote in response to two population studies in Europe demonstrating why men are more likely to receive treatment and why more women are more likely to die. Um, and again, this obstructive CAD pattern, when women look like men, when their angiograms and their heart attacks look like male pattern, they get treated, and that's indicated by our life-saving therapies on the, the lower left-hand side. Um, when women look like women, as Barbara does here with her husband, uh, they are much less likely to be treated, and of course, then the circle all the way in the lower right the, the surplus of deaths then are women because they were not recognized and not treated. So we've worked very hard in these 18 years with guidelines. Guidelines is what we say um, uh, good guidelines make good doctors great doctors because guidelines review the evidence and then provide a very effective strategy where on a population basis, if you deploy guidelines, you are more likely to save lives. And so here's a study, not ours, but we were gratified to see it. Um, and these lines are a little confusing, so I've color-coded it. Um, and the guidelines don't say if it's a man, do this, and if it's a woman, do that. The guidelines say if you're having a heart attack, treat it. And uh, they're pretty simple. They're not that hard. Uh, and here are all the lives that were saved since we've deployed guidelines in the United States. And uh, not all hospitals deploy guidelines, although this is part of health care reform. Um, the blue line is what is left, and if we thought that women should live uh, with their heart disease similar to men, uh, we still have a gap that we need to close. 
I think most of us would say, given female longevity, that women probably should do better with their heart disease than men if they could just get recognized and treated. So 18 years, and uh, what has happened in that time period, we have bent the curve. So you see now that the red line is starting to go down as opposed to going up, which was happening before the campaign. Um, these are National Heart, Lung, and Blood, Heart Truth, American Heart Association, our WISE study, as well as our guideline campaigns. Um, and this has resulted in a 43% reduction in female cardiovascular disease mortality. Um, as we reflected, are we happy with this? No, we continue to have a substantial gap um, that, again, new research uh, and new treatments need to address. Um, we continue to have problems with awareness. So uh, the, the result initially of our campaign was that uh, increasing number of women understood that heart disease was their leading healthcare threat. We have stalled in the, in the mid-50s, um, and we think that this is unacceptable. We continue to have underrepresentation of women in cardiovascular clinical trials. Um, the participant rates identified here in the red bars remains low compared to the disease prevalence. We continue to not have enough women in these trials for complicated reasons, but there are easy solutions such as capping when you get to 50% men. And this perseverates knowledge gaps which adversely impact women, uh, and it's, a, it's, it's time to say enough is enough. We continue to have underreporting of the sex of animals, the sex of the cell, or even the sex of the subject in our medical and basic science reporting. Um, it is most particularly heinous in the ones that are most translational into what we would want to do, which is improve the health of human beings, uh, not rats and mice. Um, and then last but not least, we continue, medical editors allow a minority of articles that report how many women were even in the study. So sometimes we just have even that basic gap in understanding. 17% of articles comparing treatment strategies for coronary artery disease reported sex-specific outcomes. So one of the things that we have done, and the, the tagline to this was philanthropy, um, is about 10 years ago, I started on a campaign um, reaching out to people who I knew would care about this, uh, and Barbara Streisand joined us and led the campaign uh, for an endowment for women's cardiovascular research and education. This was um, under a, a previous administration, and we were having trouble getting anything funded that said women's. And uh, as soon as it said women's, even though you said, no, 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 it's heart disease, uh, they, we had a lot of trouble getting funded. Um, so here's what our Barbara Streisand Endowment is doing. We are focusing on science, um, which is advocacy and philanthropy. Uh, more to come. We are focusing on policy. Uh, we need to change these research publications. Uh, we need to continue to change guidelines when it's important. Uh, and then finally, education. Um, identification not only of these residual health disparities for women, who, this is a, a pet peeve of mine, we're always called a subpopulation. Ladies, we are 51%, right? Uh, disparities, but disparities by ethnicity, disparities by uh, sexual preference, uh, and then we are very optimistic that technology and an open and transparent society is the way to go. So I will close with that. Thank you. Good afternoon, glad to be here. Great, terrific conference. Um, the first, I first entitled this talk, Gender and Research, Some Historical Musings, and then I went back and look at what I, looked at what I had written, and I edited in very random, so <laughs> beware. Uh, this draws on a bunch of different projects I've done, and I just thought making some uh, historical comments in general might be interesting and foster discussion. I'm gonna touch on some of the points that have already been made. So, um, where is this thing? Here it is. Uh, Peggy mentioned this before. The women who went door to door in the early years of the American Cancer Society, they were called the Women's Field Army. They, this was from the 1930s. Uh, and I show this here to point out that there's been a long connection of gender and research. Not, it just didn't start with second wave feminism in the 1970s. So there was a concern of the American Cancer Society in the 1930s. We need to focus on women's cancer so they don't get neglected. Um, nevertheless, that somehow confirmed the idea that women should be concerned with women's cancers and women's diseases, which 
as I'll suggest, is both good and bad. Many of the earliest foundations and health philanthropies were started by women. A good example uh, is Parkinson's disease. I'll say something about that in a minute. But Margaret Burke White, uh, the very famous photographer, very, very early on in the 1950s developed Parkinson's disease, and she very specifically said she, as both a Parkinson's patient and as a woman, wanted to be a guinea pig for science and underwent experimental brain surgery for her Parkinson's. She encouraged research and funding of diseases, and this was obviously Parkinson's was not just a woman's disease. A woman named Jeannie Levy founded the National Parkinson's Foundation, also in the 1950s, and most of these women who started these foundations were either the wives of sick men or the mothers of sick children, so typical women giving of themselves. But women were very involved early on in starting these foundations, and very, these foundations were very involved in research from the get-go. So there's actually a very long history of this. Um, this is a, from Life magazine in 1959 when Margaret Burke White, after her surgery, talked about her rehab. Um, Phil Strax, interesting man, um, he uh, in the 1960s was a radiologist and got very interested in breast cancer because his first wife had died of the disease. I'm going to build on some of the stuff that Peggy said. He was interested in promoting mammography, both mammography and research into it. And Phil Strax is also interesting, I'm going to come back to him in a minute, but let me just mention um, that Phil Strax was a man doing research into a woman's disease. Um, there's also a long history of women promoting research and funding into diseases and conditions and public health problems that predominantly affect men. And another project that I've done, worked on is drunk driving. And these, this is Candy Leitner who founded MAD and Women for MAD. And so it doesn't always stick along the lines of gender. Uh, and women can get very involved in men's uh, research issues as well. Back to Phil Strax. Um, Strax um, was uh, a very, very aggressive proponent of mammography. Again, he was a radiologist. His first wife had died of the disease. He was convinced if she'd had a mammogram, she wouldn't have died, this being in the 1960s. But, and he once wrote that not having a mammogram was like walking into traffic without looking. That's how powerfully he felt that. However, one thing he did that was very impressive, he did what we often don't do, which is called randomizing the first patient, right? So he decided to do the HIP study, which was one of the studies of mammography that started in New York in the 1960s, and randomized 30,000 women to get mammograms and breast exams and 30,000 women to get standard treatment. And this was actually the first study that showed that mammography, at least in the older women, was helpful. So what was, again, useful here was gender-based research that was both had an advocacy component, but also had a research component from the start. Um, when those things go hand in hand, often they're most successful, which leads me to another interesting historical figure that some of you have undoubtedly heard of, Rose Kushner. Her papers are in the Schlesinger Library. I want to put a plug in for the Schlesinger. Um, Rose Kushner was uh, probably the best known breast cancer activist in the 1970s. She's famous for basically getting rid of the radical mastectomy, um, which was being done far, far too long. Um, after Kushner um, convinced doctors through data and working with some sympathetic male physicians that radical mastectomies were not only uh, disfiguring to women but unnecessary from a science perspective, she turned her energies for the rest of her life until she died of breast cancer into NIH-based cancer research. In fact, she secretly was sent um, the grant proposals from doctors doing breast cancer research by the NCI, by the National Cancer Institute, for her to review them informally because she knew so much about the disease and felt so strongly that good science was the key to good advocacy. And she actually spent much of the, her last years working with Bernie Fisher, the famous breast cancer surgeon who basically eventually did the studies proving that you could have a lumpectomy or a simple mastectomy instead of more aggressive surgery. Um, and Kushner, again, was, was very much a second wave feminist. This was the 1970s. And her initial work came out of a feminist, gender-based perspective that breast cancer was not getting enough attention, that male doctors were making gendered assumptions about women, that women needed a voice. But that, over time, evolved into 
the notion that a way to empower women was to do good research and get them involved in that sort of research. Um, yet, science and advocacy can not only work together, but they can come into conflict. Uh, and as uh, Noel just alluded to, uh, research funds often go to those who yell the loudest or have the most prominent disease as opposed to the disease perhaps where the most need is, is necessary. And this is obviously the breast cancer heart disease dichotomy. In addition, I think those either with the disease or who have relatives with the disease and who fund the disease want positive studies that validate existing paradigms often. Um, I think that's part of the problem with mammograms is, you know, if we just do yet another study, one of these is eventually going to show that, of course, they work. We knew that all along, instead of these studies that keep giving us ambiguous information. So there's this tension between doing advocacy work uh, and hoping for positive results that, that validate things and getting these conflicting results. Um, and, and women also, as, we, as more attention gets focused to these women's diseases, I think want these urgent advances because they want to counteract the years of neglect, right? So if, if heart disease was ignored for, for too long, you know, again, we want studies that show something that, that we can get medications that work for to, to equalize things. But research is more complicated that, than that. Um, let me show you um, three diseases um, that I think are worth maybe discussing in the, in the discussion section that when I did a little extra research before this presentation, these are getting a huge amount of attention. These are now being billed as women's diseases. Lung cancer, because the rates in men are going down, the rates in women are going up. Depression, which we know, and Alzheimer's, which has rates much, much higher in women. Another historical detour. Most people don't remember, I think, that the earliest funding for Alzheimer's occurred because Rita Hayworth died of Alzheimer's and her daughter, Yasmin Aga Khan, was an incredibly powerful supporter, went to Capitol Hill, raised a, and helped raise a ton of money for Alzheimer's research. Um, but coming back to these three diseases, there have been a lot, the science is, is going gangbusters here. There have been a lot of genetic and endocrinological breakthroughs trying to give us biological explanations for why these are women's diseases. So a lot of these studies are MRI studies that show, you know, uh, PET studies that are uh, complicated brain scans that actually show metabolism in the brain. And they're saying, aha, these are different in men and women. If you look at the biology, you can see different things. So there's a lot of excitement about these new women's diseases. But I will caution that when we think back to the era of men's diseases, not more research and more being more aggressive hasn't always been a good thing. So an obvious point, but again, to get back to heart disease, you think about coronary artery disease and stenting, of which there has been an epidemic over the years. Men were more victimized, in a sense, by the over-aggressive use of stenting than women because heart disease was characterized as a man's disease. Similarly, with prostate cancer, as we know, the use of PSA testing, which is an even worse test than mammography, men are getting unnecessary prostate biopsies and examinations and treatments as well. And so I, I, I'm just trying to make the point that in our excitement to find new women's diseases that are genetic, we don't want to make the same mistakes that have happened in the case of men. Um, OK. I guess I was talking faster than I thought I would. Um, here's a good term. Just, just I, I don't want to repeat what Noel and Peggy said about the breast cancer um, heart disease dichotomy, but a, a, a nice term that I've read about recently is misfearing. So some people say that there's a that maybe characterizing it that way is a is a good way to begin to think of ways in we can reconceptualize the two diseases. Let me just close with another, I, I guess I've given a lot of cautionary tales, but let me just give, it, again, a pretty obvious one to, I think, folks in this audience, but one that maybe bears repeating in the excitement over the new technology that shows us women's diseases. And, and that's, um, all right, that was my slide to show you Dr. Oz and PSA and stenting. Um, OK. Race. OK. So. Uh, Noelle was talking about when she was in medical school learning that heart disease was a man's disease. When, and I'm sure this is true for her as well. When I was in medical school around the same time, we were learning that diseases uh, in 
uh, people of different races were different diseases, right? So this was starting to go down, but there was a long history of suggesting that different diseases acted differently in different races. Um, and for years and years, and, and a lot of that was, I think, built on a genuine interest in studying the science of these diseases, right? Um, and so if we studied, for example, uh, hypertension in an African-American population, that was a different disease than hypertension in a Caucasian population, and we needed to do that. Well, now that we've been able to sequence the genome, we know that that was a false assumption, right? So biology does not equal race, because the similarities in DNA amongst populations is so much more dramatic than the differences, right? So now we're very careful in the world of race and medicine to talk about things like ethnicity and social factors, to understand how race is itself a constructed notion, and to take that into account when we're looking at biological behaviors of diseases in different groups. My cautionary tale, as you probably have anticipated, is let's not make the same mistake in women's diseases, given our excitement about some of the new developments here. Um, I, I think people who are researching uh, women's diseases are very, very careful to talk about how biology is complicated. We talked about that a little bit this morning, how the social factors that impact biology um, can be very, very important, different populations of women. Um, will experience different things from a bi biological basis. The diseases will be different based on who they are, what exposures they've had, what populations they come from. But if you, and, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but in watching media reports and discussions of these new exciting developments in things like depression, Alzheimer's, lung cancer, um, to me at least, there, there is often very little caveat um, about the fact that the biology here is very, very complicated. Um, and that, you know, to, to use that term I think got mentioned this morning by Arthur at the very beginning, biological determinism is always, I think, in our zeal to find more and more and learn more and more, is always something we have to watch out for. That even in learning more and more about these women's diseases uh, and the biology behind them, that it remains a very, very complicated social process in which we, how we understand the findings and even indeed the biology itself. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of questions uh, of the panel here and start a discussion, but I want to remind everybody that uh, the audience is also going to have an opportunity to uh, ask, uh, ask questions. Um, and let me just begin um, with uh, um, uh, Noel and, 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 and Peggy. Uh, actually, this is just really a, a general question for all of you. I'm struck by the juxtaposition between, on the one hand, the inertia of these kinds of disparities, breast cancer, heart disease, um, men's heart disease, women's heart disease, in terms of public attention, funding, and things like that. And then the fact that, as all three of you have noted, there has been significant advocacy. I'm a political scientist, and so my first gut instinct is to think, well, there are vested interests uh, or just interests, and maybe they're not wearing anything at all, uh, that, that um, are, are, uh, certainly have um, stakes in the status quo. And at the risk of being maybe a, a little bit too confrontational, should we talk openly about what those interests are? Um, uh, I mean, it, it, you know, is it, is it, and I'm just throwing out possibilities here, is it, uh, you know, in part the National Cancer Institute and its abundant funding? Um, is it in part uh, uh, a male-dominated, although that's rapidly changing, as we know, medical establishment, and or is it in part government agencies, is it in part uh, a larger complex of factors? Um, or is, do you just think that's not a, are you completely optimistic that those kinds of vested interests will be uh, washed away by the forces of change and transparency and everything that results from this conference? <laughs> are you asking why, why breast cancer versus heart disease? Is that your or, or just a, a number of these disparities. I mean, breast mm -hmm. cancer versus heart disease or, you know, men's versus women's experiences in, 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 in so at, at some level I wanted to start with the disparities that you mentioned and also that, that Noelle mentioned. 
yes to all of those vested interests. And um, I think there are a lot of vested interests. Um, early on in the women in heart disease campaign in the early 1990s, the standard response was, these are all elderly women. Why do you care? They need to die of something. Mm -hmm. And it took research to show that the, the biggest uptick was women under the age of 55. And that was the biggest disparity. So, that, so you just have to continue to be myth busters and, and call out the truth. And I guess I'd like to say that I'm optimistic that evidence will prevail, but I'm, I'm not, I have to say it's been 20 years. And um, I don't, <laughs> I haven't seen as much change as you'd like to see, which is why we do these programs. It's like we need, we need the public to rise up and say, this is not acceptable. We need writers to, to write about it in a way that people can get, not my scientific way. What would you say? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry, Are you going to sit? Go. No, you can go, go ahead. Go okay. ahead. I'll, um, I'll answer something. Yeah, no, I, I'm going to agree completely. Um, you know, and the vested interests are complicated, right? So the, the vested interest is um, not just, I mean, this morning we talked a lot about pharmaceutical companies, now we're talking about research. But think about uh, institutions. You know, all of uh, major medical centers now have breast centers that are huge money makers, right? And it's, it's really hard to sort of say, you know, we're going to stop doing mammograms because the data's not good. I mean, who's going to say that? Uh, you know, the head, of the head of the medical center, these are, you know, so, and, and they're not, it's not that they're bad people, it's just that there are financial realities and the data is ambiguous and some people say that it's still a good test. So it, it's very, very hard, uh, you know, I think, and part of it is, again, we have existing paradigms that Peggy was suggesting. So some of this means overthrowing things that have been in existence for decades. And it's, these are very, very hard, you know, they're hard things to do, vested interests, both financially and psychologically. Yeah, I, I, I always like it when a doctor says that so that I don't have to, because I sound like a conspiracy freak if I say that about the, <laughs> the breast centers. That, but I, I, I do think that's a big issue. And women themselves, I mean, there's, you know, the idea of social efficacy is a really powerful idea that you want something that makes you feel better, even if you kind of start to know that it doesn't. Like, like I, I, if you think about Vicks VapoRub, right? Remember how your mom used to rub the Vicks VapoRub on your chest? And Vicks VapoRub didn't do nothing, you know? It had no medical application whatsoever, but it really did make you feel better. And that's social that. efficacy. Um, and sometimes that feels good to a culture. Yeah. So that's an interest, too. Yeah. Just to follow up on that a little bit, um, the, the, you're all, all three of you are pointing at some level to the, to the important role that the media, uh, celebrities, um, even places like Radcliffe, especially places like Radcliffe, if I can say so, would play in uh, promoting awareness, in uh, drawing attention to these disparities and things like that. And I wanted to ask you about um, uh, either for uh, sort of experiences or tales of the role of the media and of, and I want to emphasize this, the new media uh, in, um, or new forms of media in this debate. And, and I say this because of the recent New York Times article about um, uh, you know, contrasting uh, the growing number of women in traditional journalism, uh, I mean, I don't mean to, to, you know, not traditional, but combined with, combined with um, uh, the culture that has taken, um, uh, taken hold in uh, a lot of uh, programming and uh, new media, um, which according to the Times story was not so women friendly, was kind of male dominated and, and, and things like that, which at some level is again potentially a cautionary tale, is like is the very direction that the media is going, you know, Twitter based, uh, blog based, things like that, um, one that might retard our progress in this respect. And at some level, that is for you. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. I, I do not know what this new media of which you speak, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak to new media. Um, but but I, I can say, you know, I, I, a couple of things. One is the, my personal um, experience as a journalist, and a pr particularly of writing this last story, which um, was on the cover of the magazine, and I knew was going to frame a debate. I knew that I had the potential, not always when I write for the magazine, but I knew that this story was going to be important. And what I wanted was a story that from there on in, no journalist could talk about this without referring to that, because otherwise they would be ignorant. 
um, you know, I, I didn't necessarily get that, but, but it was, but I, I was so conscious every single word I was conscious of writing of the impact and that if I wasn't really spot on right, if everything wasn't right, mm -hmm. I was gonna get chopped off at the knees on that story. So I don't think I have ever worked so hard mm -hmm. at getting a story right before. Um, a couple of weeks after that story came out, maybe a month was when the Angelina Jolie, y'all know about the, the Angelina Jolie uh, having her double mastectomy because she was positive for a BRCA mutation came out and it kind of blew my story out of the water. Um, and it was more, you know, I, it, her decision, her medical decision was completely defensible. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but I felt that the, ultimately it again stoked this um, misfearing of, mm -hmm. of breast cancer, an inappropriate response that in an epidemic of mastectomy and double mastectomy, uh, was not that women were going to forget the reasons for her double mastectomy and just see brave Angelina getting a double mastectomy, which is now the feminist apparently thing to do. And I was really struck by that. And I was also really struck by the way it was reported. Um, you know, we of course fetishize breasts in our culture, and I think that's partly why breast, is, breast cancer and not heart disease. Yeah. Um, and but we fetishize them as, as objects of desire for others. We fetishize them as something from the outside in. And we're really conscious of how they're gonna look. But we don't really care so much about how they feel. So on one hand, you have these sexualized breast cancer campaigns like Save the Tatas and I Heart Boobies and all of this. And on the other hand, women are supposed to not care at all when you remove your breasts and just be conscious of living longer for your children or whatever else you're supposed to do. And um, with Angelina, the media kept talking. I looked in everything. They kept saying, her breasts look great. Her boob job looks great. And I kept thinking, nobody apparently seems to have talked about or been aware that those things on her chest are numb. And it was really interesting to me. I would talk to women that I knew who, and I'd say, you know, you can't feel anything in these things. Can't feel that. Um, they didn't know. And so how it looked was so much more important than how it felt to the woman. And I just found that really interesting. Yeah. Thoughts? Um, we, we recently did a, a piece working with Leslie Stahl on 60 Minutes, which the springboard was the Ambien. The, after 20 years post-approval, the FDA finally decides uh, that uh, women were being overdosed. And then the data was quite clear 20 years ago. Um, and it took acts of advocacy and campaigning to get them to even acknowledge that. Um, but we were able to get her to do a broader piece that really demonstrated that uh, essentially, uh, with the exception of drugs that are exclusively taken by women, so oral contraceptives, uh, the majority of drugs that are taken by uh, everybody in the US today have been dominantly tested on men. And this piece got surprisingly little attention. Uh, so I don't know. I, I'm here to find out why we can't get people's attention. Uh, my good friend Rita Redberg is the editor of JAMA Internal Medicine, and, and she says this all the time, and I think it bears repeating. The physician is getting ready to prescribe a pill to a man, and he says to him, and this, this pill has been demonstrated to be safe and effective in women. <laughs> mm. And that's, that's what we face every day. Uh, and at Paula Johnson's uh, summit in Boston a month ago, uh, Leslie asked Kathleen Sebelius, uh, don't you think that all drugs that are approved and consumed by women should be now tested, given the ambient story? And Kathleen said, no, I don't think they should. Mm. Um, <laughs> I know she resigned, maybe because of that, Paula. Yeah, right. Um, I, I, just as far as the media, I, you know, the new media question is a great one. I don't, I don't know enough about the media to to, to answer that. Um, but I, yeah, having written a book on famous patients and the media, which is how I got interested in this, I, I tended to have come out at the end with a pretty sanguine view of things. I, I think getting information out there is good, even if some of it's wrong, and at least the educated consumer reading amongst many sources, reading an article like Peggy's and realizing the quality of it and how even-handed it was and how much good information is in something like that, can, that the media is ultimately 
more helpful, even though some of the stories are, are you know, fantastic and, and not that good. The, the other thing, I'll just put a plug in for science journalists, um, yeah. who many of whom now undergo special training and go, I've, been, I've appeared at some of these gatherings where they bring people uh, up to talk to science journalists about medicine. And, and the, you know, some of them are just incredibly well versed and really try to write very informed articles. Now they'll complain that they write a good article and then the editor changes it to make it sexier and then the headline person destroys the whole thing. So it, it's complicated, but you know, I, I think working with the media and thinking about the ways in which new media, um, even if they're sound bites, can try to get more uh, accurate information out is very important. I think that issue of hostility to women in new media has been partly brought up because of mm -hmm. the extreme levels of sexual harassment of any woman who writes online about women. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it is, I've experienced it, and I think I've experienced it at a lower level than a lot of women, but it is horrible. Mm. It's personal. It, it's in your house. It's a really, really frightening thing that I never experienced before yeah. new media. So I think that that's been the biggest issue with new Can media Can I follow up on that, though? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have worries about the effect of that kind of media culture on the treatment of the issues we're talking about today? I have um, a lot of concern about the treatment of that uh, of women on new media, about anything concerning women. As I think about writing my next book mm -hmm. and what I'm working on, I do have these thoughts of like, God, I can't get my home address off the internet, you know, and these mm. kooks who write to me and say horrible things could find me or my yeah. child. Right. And so it does, you know, it doesn't stop me from writing anything, but it's, it scares me. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And now I've said that, and this is going to be online, so now that's right. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We'll come protect you. Thank you. Thanks, absolutely. You can give out my address. It's I have an electric fence and a really Sorry. mean dog. <laughs> So we have some uh, 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 questions from uh, the audience and, and the other panelists. Yes, Paula? Thank you so much. Um, I just want to make thank you, Noel, for, for mentioning the summit. It was, it was Peggy Hamburg. It was, uh, it was uh, Dr. Peggy Hamburg, who's the oh, right, commissioner right, right. of the FDA, mm -hmm. um, who felt that we didn't need to go back. But I just want to make two That's quick good, comments and then maybe pose the, the question, which is, um, we're going to talk in our next panel a little bit about the lack of appreciation of science, the lack of attention to the data, um, the reconstruction of science for one's own purposes. And I do think that there's some way in which the way we talk is kind of getting back to this anger, Peggy, about anyone writing about women. But in this arena of talking about sex differences, about talking about sex and gender and health and disease, and clearly discussing the data which are pretty clear in certain areas. And whether it be in women altogether, there are very significant differences in terms of how, for example, some racial and ethnic minorities, uh, particularly women, experience certain diseases, et cetera. Those are, those are clear data. There's a way in which our scientific community does not embrace the data. Mm. There's a way in which the scientific community does not necessarily believe it, embrace it, and the result of that is what we're seeing in our journals, which I would venture to say is not necessarily good science when you're not including both sexes, you're not addressing sex. And so how do we change that discussion? Because if we, as a scientific community, are not necessarily um, believing what are pretty good evidence, how are we going to get people who are non-scientific to believe it? So uh, what, what does that dialogue look like? How do we begin to change that paradigm? You've got to invite social scientists to scientific meetings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mm -hmm. No, I think, you know, uh, look, it's, I think it's, you know, the, the ways in which data are, which I, I don't want to spoil what's going to come up next, but you know, I think that in an interesting way, um, a lot of discussion of how data can be interpreted in, in different ways does victimize very good data at, at some point. And I, I think that that, you know, to some degree, that needs to be a discussion at, at journals, right? I, I, I don't know. I, you know if, if people are doing this, are, are editorials at least going into those journals that question why, I know people are trying to write these, um, but that questions why certain data 
is being reported a different way, why women aren't getting into trials. You know, I think it, it, to some degree it's like a grassroots educational type of process where if we really think that that's happening, then it's a disservice to everyone not to at least try to call out the people who are making the decisions. So the, the 20 to 30 percent of, of cardiovascular clinical trials now that include women is a big step up from before Bernadine Healy and, and the Congress enacted the NIH uh, requirement. And, and so I, I would say what we need to do is more policy and we need to hold people's feet to the fire. And if, if women are a majority of cardiovascular disease victims, we can throw them a bone and say 50%, and you cap it. And those will be rules. Those will be policies. The FDA actually has a policy on file since the 80s that requires that drugs that will be used by both sexes be tested adequately in women. And they have failed to enforce that policy. Um, so again, I, I, think, I think that we need to get enough people pissed off about this to uh, start to do policy and laws. Uh, yes, Liz. Um, I'm Liz Cohen, the dean here at Radcliffe. Um, I'm speaking very much as a lay person, learning a lot today. Um, I, in a lot of your discussions, you're, dis you're talking about a funding that's done through government agencies and government funding. And yet we know what came up in the morning session when we talked about uh, the pharmaceutical companies and the impact they have, that an awful lot of research and increasingly more research is happening um, through pri the private sector. And I wonder if you, if, if you might talk about um, any similarities and differences in, f in scientific research, medical research, happening in the public and the private sector. Do we have more influence on these issues, perhaps, if, in, if it does happen under government auspices? What kinds of checks are there when R&D is happening within this private sector that is being very driven by the marketplace? So the, the data, the, the 10 and 10, so 10 times more women will die of heart disease, but we spend 10 times as much money, that combines federal and philanthropic, the Susan B. Komen, Ravlon, et cetera, et cetera, funding. Um, so that's, that's data that we've put together. It does not include industry funding which is harder to get at. So my understanding about this, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that I've had those in the field of metastatic cancer say to me that there's very little interest in big pharma in finding drugs for metastatic disease because it has so many variants that um, it's not a really big profit maker as it would be to find treatment for early disease. Um, and so that affects that research, I, I have, cons I mean, a lot of what I write about is concerns about advocacy groups funding research, you know, Komen funding research. On one hand, you know, a group like Komen is taking huge amounts of money from Chevron. Does that, what kind of impact, subtle or, you know, they'll say it has no impact, but, you know, what kind of impact might that have on what, the, what kind of research they, ch they choose to fund? If you're being, um, g taking a lot of money from cosmetics companies, what kind of research does that, so the, and, and then there's the potential for uh, the pinkwashing, which I kind of mentioned in passing, where a company, and again, you know, let's pick on Chevron. Um, on the, when I was doing my reporting, right before I, I, the, I, I was doing it, the, there was a gigantic refinery fire um, just north of Berkeley, where I live. I saw this huge plume of smoke, and Chevron ended up getting the largest fine ever levied against a uh, uh, company um, in the history of the state of California for willful um, violations and ignoring um, the well-being of their employees. At the same time, if you clicked on Comb in Southern California, they were on the front page of the website, Chevron, a good neighbor to California. Mm. That's called pinkwashing. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just, uh, you know, I think, Liz, that's a, a huge problem. I, you know, I mean, I, I think we're, here, here we've been criticizing <laughs> NIH and government funders for not doing enough. You know, pharmaceutical companies, they're, they're under no real, it's, it's a moral obligation, I guess, to do research that really pushes uh, the envelope forward and questions existing beliefs, but their shareholders are what, they're, who they're beholden to, I guess. So, you know, I think that maybe this is, you know, to some degree it's the job of the media to, to look at what's being funded by these companies and what their research is and is not showing, but it's a very hard cause. Can I just uh, add? Um, just, I actually think in terms of, you know, so any 
any private or company conducted clinical trial that's conducted with the idea of getting a new device or drug on the market is FDA regulated. And this gets back to some of the problems of inertia uh, at the FDA, I think. And I mean, I've written a little bit about the agency. And I think at some level, there's the older mindset that comes from the thalidomide scare. Mm -hmm. The idea that women were excluded out of this paternal concern that we didn't want to give certain kinds of, or didn't want to expose women to certain kinds of pregnancy risks um, coming out of the 1960s. But there's an inertia that I think one can detect at the FDA that they've been very responsive to um, some constituencies. I think the AIDS uh, activists and, and advocacy is example. But if you look at the Plan B debacle um, uh, from a few years ago, uh, I think it's fair to say that despite the fact that now the commissioner, the chief of the Drug Regulatory Bureau, Janet Woodcock and others are women, and then in fact women dominate the top levels, that there may be a kind of procedural inertia there that, that really requires people in the media, the social sciences, and top medical scientists like we have here on, on the panel and, 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 and at Harvard to really still make that case and press people like Peggy Hamburg and others. Do we have questions from the audience, of people who'd like to uh, walk up to the microphone and we can establish a, uh, a queue? Go ahead. Uh, Laura Henze Russell again. I'm that pissed off person you're looking for. <laughs> uh, I don't know what to call myself. Maybe it's the impatient patient, but 38 years of health, 21 of disease that got really bad, and now at 60, I'm healthy again. And it was due to nothing that's really on the radar screen. I mean, I hope next year's conference can be who decides genetics, toxins, medicine, dentistry, <laughs> regulators, and the public's health. Um, I have three beefs with the FDA. I won't go into detail. Um, I am now trying to convince the Mass Department of Public Health that very outdated clinical trials data that take no account not only for, gen for gender, but none for all the genetic factors that have been shown to influence how we react to various toxins. You know, it, it's just nuts. So I hope I find allies here. Keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And social media is actually my friend because too much of the regular media is not my friend. Mm. So. Thanks for a great panel. My name is Ann Tusignor. I'm a health insurance executive. And earlier in my career, I helped uh, create the Faulkner Center um, for breast um, mammography. Um, so, but I'm interested in both sides. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, the question I have is um, not to be facetious, but do, do the heart organizations ever talk to the breast organizations? And you know, when you think of the, the pink um, ribbons all over, it's such a well-oiled, um, almost, uh, organization and you know it seems if there could be some cross fertilization with using the awareness of breast cancer and having those advocates also talk about the importance of heart disease at least you're talking to a female audience and, a, and an audience that's engaged and I guess the other question or is the um, the fact that it's big business for Susan B Komen and other organizations um, keeping them away from uh, sharing the exposure um, um, with other with other groups so these are excellent suggestions. And at an institution level, there, there are example programs, and ours is one of them, where we actually now, um, one of the big uh, problems five to 10 years post breast cancer treatment is premature heart disease. So we actually have an integrated system now where women that are cancer survivors are offered um, you know, to, see, to be seen in our cardio-oncology clinic. And the other thing that uh, you can do is, uh, it, it's not highly effective, don't, uh, not always working, it's research still. But when you have your mammogram, if you see those microcalcifications, they do uh, at some level predict heart disease. And so there may be some synergy there in your mammogram actually helping understand whether or not you might be at risk for future heart disease. So these kinds of things are, can happen at an institution or within a research or within a um, clinical care program. The, the fundraising is 
zero sums game, both at NHLBI and NCI, as well as Komen and American Heart. And uh, I just have not been able to get anybody to sit at the table and talk about that kind of stuff. But we can remain optimistic. <laughs> You know, and I, I also, I, no, I was talking with Noel, I guess, over email before this and saying, I, I always want to tell people to be careful about using breast cancer as mm -hmm. a model or envying it because so much of the pink ribbon culture has become primarily about visibility. And, you know, that's great, but it isn't actually moving things forward. And it, in fact, starts going in all these kind of weird directions like the, you know, like those I Heart Boobies people and all these other people yeah. who are raising millions and millions of dollars oh, wow. that they might as well be flushing down the toilet, frankly. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would, I would caution anybody yeah. about following this example. Hi, my name is Leah. I'm a first year student at Wellesley College and I'm planning to major in uh, women's and gender studies. And um, in my class, we have been talking a lot about um, trans folk, and so my question to you um, concerns trans people. Um, I noticed there's been a lack of mention of people, of trans women and men in um, this panel so far and in the past one. So my, um, Dr. Lerner, you had mentioned earlier in your speech that um, the groups that get the most funding are the ones that yell the loudest. And so I was wondering, um, from my knowledge right now, there's a lack of research concerning trans women and men in terms of um, like medical concerns that like gravely concern them more than cisgender people. So I was wondering, is, is there enough research being done and is there a move towards in, like, increasing that research? And um, also, because this panel is called Who Decides, um, who decides whether these people are going to be treated as men or as women when these research are being uh, <laughs> well, conducted? Yeah. I was going to break <laughs> I'll skip the last one. <laughs> no, I was like, it was, um, well, I'll just I'll say a couple things. Is, is there enough research? Absolutely not. Um, you know, I think that you know, what we see historically, I mean, I was being a little glib about you know, who yells loudest, but you know, men predominated because men controlled the money and men ruled society for too long and then now women have have a, a seat at the table not enough as we're learning here and you know other groups in society that are smaller more stigmatized less public you know need to yell that much harder I you know I, I think and yet you know I, I think um, transgender people are helped by research into other diseases. They're, they're, it gets to the point I was making before, do you only advocate narrowly for your particular interests or broadly? But having said that, you know, I, I, I would, you know, absolutely, you know, we need to advocate for sp the specific health issues that affect both physical and, and emotional that affect that population. I mean, there clearly needs to be more research. And, you know, certainly to the degree that activists can emerge from that community or people who aren't members of that community to support it and lobby Congress, lobby the NIH and get more funding, you know, I think it's, it's terrific. You know, I don't know enough about the gender issues. You know, my guess is whatever way, you know, I think it's a very complicated individual decision how people want to label themselves, but, you know, the, to, to focus on the group of transgender more specifically is at least initial step to get more research more broadly. You know, I would just say that you, you could reframe the question because you can't really change your gender without the healthcare system. Uh, and so I would throw it right back in there. It's the law of unattended consequences. And if you don't, if as a physician community, we don't understand the short and long-term consequences of this, and that means a call for more research. So just turn it right around. Sorry, could you repeat the question one more time? I'm just trying to understand what you're, what you're asking. Well, the, you, you can't change your sex without a physician currently. You could maybe try to get illegal drugs, but you, you basically can't. So they need to study it. So that's a call for more research. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I'm humbled by this distinguished faculty here. My name's Peter Dragonis. I've been a physician in the Boston area until about 15 years ago when I had an accident. I had to stop and do other things for a while. However, my passion has been women's care and breast, gynecological, and fertility. And I've devoted a lot of time to my commitment to giving the patient, the individual, the best that I could find 
like fi finding Barbara Smith at the Mass General, who I think is a national treasure when it comes to women's breast care, and I believe it's Avon that she, uh, that's his portrait. But I have a simple question. I'm bothered, in the past I was bothered by this business of telling women they should have pap smears every five years or so. And now I see they're trying to, uh, how shall we say, uh, change the direction and the uh, knowledge to women given as uh, preventive health care. That they, these mammograms now, uh, digital, whatever, they're not worth it. They're not going to diagnose you. I want to know from this distinguished panel, do they really have enough scientific clinical studies to be able to say this? Or is this coming from Obama scare? Or is it coming from, where is it coming from? Because I don't see any matching factual literature to go along with this recent proclamation. I think it's about two or three weeks old. I don't know. But thank you very much. I'm very obliged to you all for your great comments. He's asking, is there, is there any evidence to support it? Yeah, there, there's, a lot, there's been studies um, done for years, and the study that just came out in February uh, from Canada that was in, that, was that in the British Medical Journal um, was a 25-year-long um, randomized study that was looking at the impact of um, mammography on mortality and found that uh, it was the same for women who had annual mammograms and for women who did not have annual mammograms but had annual clinical exams, that there was no difference in mortality rate. <laughs> More studies, I'm sorry to tell you, studies. because that just, just describes a population uh, centered in England. It does not represent a global representation. If you take a look at, uh, at the um, piece that I wrote, if you go online and look at the piece, there's um, many studies, studies listed that you can that are linked to, and you can just I'm go right through them. I'm willing to refer to them. Thank you. Uh -huh. I just wanted to make it one with just on that question. I just it, something came to my mind. I think it's interesting that we're the pap smear is being phased out, basically, and that is a, boy, talk about a, a, the holy grail. That was a huge success. I, the number of lives that that test saved is so dramatic. We, we take it for granted almost these days, but cervical cancer was like the third leading cause of death for women in this country before the pap test. But the reason we're successfully phasing it out is as a replacement test, the HPV test, yeah. which is, and there's not a replacement test for mammograms, at least yet, and that's part of the difficulty of letting go of mammograms, I think. And again, uh, you know, part, part of what has um, changed is that we have treatments that are better, and that has offset a lot of what mammography used to do. Women are the ones who have the breast. Men do, too. I know two of my friend's doctors who died mm -hmm. of metastatic breast cancer. So it's not limited to women only, but it's only 5% for men. But I'm not going men versus women, because that's not, a, that's not my uh, direction. My direction is, how do you convince the public oh. that they don't need, that's the second question. How do you I convince see. them after all these years? First of all, the pap smear, I understand. But uh, how do you convince them they shouldn't have mammograms? Now, we saw this so, late, I, let me make one, really can I add something? Yeah. We saw this lovely lady from mm -hmm. Faulkner Hospital, and I really have to say that Norm Sadowski and that group there, I sent all my mammography to them because they were outstanding in the Boston community for what they did, and they do still deserve a lot of credit. Okay. And I think they had some national recognition to that fact. Thank, thank you. I want to make sure that we get some other questioners as thank well. You. Thank you, sir. Important. Yeah, I wanted to direct, I love this panel. Thank you. Um, I want to direct this to Noel. When you look at the differences in, in men, women, and heart disease, of course, as many kinds of heart disease. But I want to think about the, the whole kind of pipeline. First of all, that it's undiscovered and un, you know, in women. But then, does it behave differently? Do you treat chronic heart disease in women differently than men? And if someone, a woman has a heart attack, winds up in the hospital, makes it to the hospital, do you treat her differently than you would have men? So can you say something about that kind of whole pathway and what the big differences are, or maybe we don't know, we're still discovering that. Thank you. 
So it's a great question. Um, there aren't any real big differences. The differences will range on the order of 10, 15, or 20 percent. But one of the things that we need to all keep in mind is there are 500,000 women that die every year. So 10 or 15 or 20 percent actually is a, is a pretty big difference. That's a lot of, a lot of lives. Um, and women in general uh, do worse at pretty much everything once they have their heart disease. Um, most of the drugs uh, appear to work well in women, although they have not been adequately tested in women. So we have decided in this campaign, rather than sort of put women up on a pedestal and say that they shouldn't be treated, even though we have insufficient information, uh, uh, the Im information that we do have suggests that they do benefit by treating and that we need to do, we need to test the drugs and we need to do more, more research. Um, but women uh, one year post heart attack are more likely to be dead compared to men. One year post heart attack, if they are alive, they are much more likely to have a more uh, poor quality of life compared to men. They are more likely to have residual angina or shortness of breath, which are, are signs and symptoms of heart disease. Um, and this is not all elderly women. These are, these are young women. These are women with young children. These are women trying to go to work every day. Um, does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, Jean Chapin Smith, clinical social worker, whatever, and sister, <laughs> sister of, of a woman who has, um, I've just blocked hmm. Alzheimer's. <laughs> And I'm very aware of the fact that there's been almost no reference to Alzheimer's here in relation to it, in the whole number of these issues, including obviously funding and the huge gaps between funding for Alzheimer's and um, cancer, for example. And I just would be interested in any comments, thoughts about that and the direction. I'm not an Alzheimer's expert, um, but there is a lot of dementia there's a growing epidemic of dementia that is dominantly being driven by two things. One is the aging epidemic, and because women on average live longer than men still, there is a surplus of Alzheimer's because Alzheimer's is very age-related. The second um, contributor to the big dementia epidemic is cardiovascular disease. And there's a lot of vascular dementia out there um, that is just white matter. It's little tiny strokes that uh, we would have called a stroke, except they didn't really clinically have an evident stroke. So um, it is, that is true. And um, there are preventive strategies for cardiovascular disease. Uh, the previous panel discussed the cholesterol. And I'm just seeing that he's not here anymore. So unfortunately, I don't get to debate him. But the, the new guidelines just came out this last November. And the new guidelines will allow you, you can all go onto your smartphones or the internet, just go to the American College of Cardiology or American Heart Association guidelines, cholesterol guidelines. And uh, you can Google your own lifetime risk of cardiovascular disease. And you will all find, and I've done this for myself, lifetime risk is 40%, pretty much irregardless of what you put in age, sex, blood pressure, cigarette smoking. And that is true of these vascular dementias as well. Lifetime risk is about 40%. People are always shocked. And then that's why I open everything with one out of two will get cardiovascular disease. Look to the right, look to the left. One out of three will die of this. And these cholesterol-lowering therapies plus the baby aspirin actually is a reasonably effective. It is not curative. It does not completely prevent it. But it very much reduces not only cardiovascular disease, but this vascular dementia. So um, you know, we can become demented, or, or we can take a few pills, or try to exercise and eat right, which turns out to be pretty hard for most people. I will just add, uh, there are some um, uh, Alzheimer's drugs in the pipeline. And one of the things that the FDA has been doing in recent years, actually just this past year, is to provide some new guidelines for companies to develop those drugs um, that actually um, are, uh, they have the aim to accelerate the, the development pipeline for them. 
Um, there's actually some debate about whether that's a good thing, given that these drugs may become very widely used and will have Vioxx-like markets, and so that safety concerns, uh, some people argue, should be paramount, but that is happening. I'm a women's health nurse practitioner at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, and I actually take care of a lot of trans patients. And I want to remind everyone that you can change your gender without changing your body. It's all in presentation. And because we are so wired to male-female binary, a few visual triggers can make all the difference in the world of how someone is perceived. So a huge part of gender is presentation, not genitals. I think that the biggest challenges we face in caring for transgender patients is dealing with insurance companies, because they kind of want it both ways. They don't want to cover procedures for people of the opposite gender. It's hard to get approval for a hysterectomy for a male, OK? So if someone has changed their social gender, They've got a new driver's license. They can even sometimes have all their legal papers changed, or they can at least have a letter from the prescriber of their hormones to say that they are the other gender. You try to get approval for a hysterectomy, it's extremely difficult. On the other hand, there is actually a movie, it's a little bit older now, called Southern Comfort, about a trans man who, do, who had not had genital surgery and who got cervical cancer, and his insurer refused to cover it because it was a man, he couldn't have cervical cancer. And as the T in GLBT comes more and more to the forefront, it's a very different, you don't need surgery to be gay or lesbian. You don't need hormones to be gay or lesbian. And we talk about GLBT as a unified group, but trans, gendered patients have a lot of needs that our society and our health insurance system just cannot handle. Thank you. Great. Uh, Judy Norsegi in Our Bodies, Ourselves, and I do want to say that, uh, <laughs> that um, many, many, many people collaborated in the latest edition, and there is a wonderful chapter on gender identity and sexual orientation, which really describes a lot of what the previous speaker was trying to condense in a short space of time. So it's a great chapter. Plus, there's a group of individuals in this country who's just finished a book, um, Our Bodies Are Trans Selves, and it just came out literally a month ago, and it, for those of you interested, I recommend it to you. Two questions. One is to you, Peggy. And it really has to do with the fact that the President's Cancer Panel in late 2010, I think, came out with an amazing report, very hard-hitting about the role of the environment in cancer. I did a search of major media within the following month or two. In fact, I wouldn't have known about it if it didn't come in an email, and there was hardly any attention to given what I considered a major document, so everyone should go look at it. And for you, Baron, by the way, thank you so much for bringing up Rose Kushner and all that she did. We worked closely with her in the 1970s. And I'd like you to reflect a bit upon the nature of um, advocacy then and now, some of what she did. And in my mind, of course, there are a lot of breast cancer advocacy groups out there, but the particular way, say, breast cancer action in San Francisco works in contrast to, say, maybe the Komen Foundation. I'd like your thoughts on that. And I, I'm sorry that Mary Costanz isn't saying anything, but she um, actually would have probably raised an important question about how sometimes earlier treatment because of earlier detection reduces some of the more invasive yeah. treatments that women get. Something I just want to... Um, that, that are, first of all, Judy, um, I, I feel kind of like my, my, my heart is beating kind of fast to see you in the flesh. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of starstruck. <laughs> um, I can't tell you how you've inspired me, really, my whole, um, since college. Uh, but that report, um, which was on the um, percentage of uh, of cancer research money that went to the to environmental concerns defined very broadly, including both the environment in the body as well as um, toxicity outside of the body. It actually was covered in the Times. 
Um, there was a big piece in there, but it was not broadly covered, and it was incredibly important, and you should look it up. Breast Cancer Fund and some of the other groups were in there. There's a, there's a lot of breast cancer advocacy groups out of there, and I had this whole section in the piece that I had to cut, which was about Rose Kushner, and it was also about, you know, it was about these sort of two strands of the breast cancer movement. Um, Rose Kushner, who I think of as being, coming very much out of the women's health movement, the Our Bodies, Ourselves movement, the grassroots advocacy, and then the person who gets, you know, the credit of bringing breast cancer out is Betty Ford, right? And Betty Ford, um, you know, spoke out, Shirley Temple actually did first, but Betty Ford talked about having cancer in Newsweek magazine, and um, at that time there was a one, you, you went under, and when you woke up, either your breast was gone, or it wasn't, and it was a one-step procedure. You didn't know it was gonna happen. And one of the things that Rose Kushner was advocating for, and, and you probably know this better than I do, was the two-step procedure, right? Was having a biopsy, and then waking up and being told whether you had cancer or not, just not suddenly having it. And she apparently called Betty Ford, she had some connection to her, and asked her to please, you know, have the two-step procedure. And Betty Ford's answer was, um, my, the president has made his decision. Mm. And, I think, and I don't, you know, and I have great respect for Betty Ford and, and everything that she did, but she came from a different, a different mindset. And in a way, I feel like that set up kind of the two strands of the breast cancer movement um, and, and the Komen strand, which, which is kind of a less disruptive um, kind of strand, and the Breast Cancer Action, National Breast Cancer Coalition, Breast Cancer Fund, um, uh, Breast Cancer Consortium, uh, those groups that, um, and I'm missing many, but th those types of groups that are more disruptive um, and, and less um, compliant and have been questioning authority and questioning treatment and questioning doctors and have been willing, like Rose Kushner was, to get thrown out of conferences when she gets up in front of a group of oncologists and advocates for um, uh, lumpectomies. I'll just piggyback on that um, and, and say I think one of the great things about the breast cancer movement, it's a big tent movement, right? So it's very inclusive from more radical views to more conservative views. Um, the downside is, as we know, if you're around a table of relatives and everyone has a different opinion you, and you're trying to get something done, you can't get as much done perhaps in a focused way as you might like to. And, um, you know, I, I often think about, um, you know, I think my sympathies are with a more progressive view as a historian just trying to, to understand this and I wish there was more attention to the environment and breast cancer and all cancers and, um, and, and so people sometimes are very, you know, and Peggy's written well about this, you know, it's uh, people who participate in uh, pink related events, you know, are they doing a disservice, uh, one could ask. And, and I come back and I say no, um, because, I, you know, I think, um, you know, certainly women who've gone through breast cancer, women or men who've gone through any disease who do really any sort of activism and move beyond their disease, um, I, I think it's to be applauded. Um, so, but, but again, I think the downside of that is it's, it's often hard to push a movement maybe in a more progressive direction if you're welcoming so many people in, and that's what we're continuing to struggle with. And can I just say, I think that you have to, if you're going to become involved, I mean, I, I don't write what I write to, you know, make people stop being involved in breast cancer activism, but to question, to, to look at the group that you're, that you're throwing your energy behind and putting your money into to make sure that they are actually doing the work that is important to you. If environmental work is important to you, then you should be involved with a uh, breast cancer advocacy organization that focuses on environmental work mm -hmm. and not be involved with one that is giving less than 1% of its $432 million to that, to that cause. How might that be? I'm kidding. I'm just... <laughs> just Peggy, uh, Noel, Barron, thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. That was great. <laughs>